These are my uh, disclosures. So I was asked to talk by uh, Cara about the potential impact of cytochrome transporter and muscarinic adrenergic receptor gene polymorphisms on lower urinary tract therapy. Immediately I had to go to the dictionary to look it up because it's not my comfort zone. What is my comfort zone is overactive bladder. And uh, we all know about overactive bladder and how common it is. It's about 12% of the population. This is the EPIC study. And about 4,000 or 5,000 of the 19,000 people who are interviewed come from this country. So it's very common, increases with age. Management OAB I'm familiar with, uh, along with the algorithm and guidelines and how to do it. And then I see there's medical therapy which is involved in it, so uh, I'm familiar with that as well. The prevalence of LUTs, uh, that's uh, men and women, is very common, and this is from the EPIC study. Increases with age, uh, common symptoms in both men and women. Uh, male LUTs is common, and it's multifactorial. Lower urinary tract innervation uh, leading to current drug targets. Uh, right now we have sympathetic drugs, uh, beta-3 agonists, uh, alpha receptors. We have drugs that work on the, uh, on the uh, glandular component of the lower urinary tract and the prostate as well. We have muscarinic receptor antagonists. We used to have parasympathetic drugs, but we don't. We have drugs that work on other aspects of lower urinary tract, such as uh, what happens with uh, urine, urine production overnight. We also have drugs such as botulinum toxin that works on the sensory side and also the motor side. So how does this play into it? Well, um, then I had to educate myself as far as what genetics was all about because my, my training in genetics stopped when I left medical school and then I trained a little bit more when I, when I finished urology in the late 70s. But since then, I really didn't have much of a chance to apply uh, my knowledge of genetics to the drug therapy. Well, I had to read about the Human Genome Project and went to uh, a, a text, a major text uh, that's uh, very easy to find. It's called, and it's referred to in the lower right hand, it's called Genetics for Dummies. So I had to read that book, and it's actually quite a good book. It tells me about the Human Genome Project. Uh, using technology that was prevalent at the time, it started in 1985, and then went on to 2008, uh, they went through and were able to sequence uh, various living organisms, uh, simple living organisms uh, such as uh, Haemophilus, uh, E. coli, uh, Drosophila, uh, and then in 2008, there was a first high-resolution map of genetic variation was published among humans. All of this information is available to the, to the world. And what Dr. Dedenis was talking about, bioinformatics, is only part of this. Bioinformatics includes all of the information about the genome, uh, genetic typing, polymorphisms, whatever is known, along with drugs, et cetera, everything. It's called bioinformatics. And I had to go to a website, which I'll talk to you about soon, but it's interesting looking at the different sizes, the genome size of various organisms, and the human is the fourth from the bottom, and, and as uh, Simo mentioned before, there are about uh, three billion base pairs in the human genome, and about 22,000 or more genes that make up uh, the organism. We think that we're very complex, but look at corn. They have more genes than we do. They don't talk to us very much. But what about the structure of DNA, which is the basis of, uh, of the Human Genome Project? Well, I did know because of Watson and Crick. Uh, compo it's composed of four nucleotides, uh, bases, five carbon sugars, phosphate, the base pairs, like a rung of a ladder you can see over here, then it's in a double helix. There's a primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure similar to proteins. It's all in the nucleus uh, uh, and it's anti-parallel. Uh, and then uh, this is the DNA uh, which forms part of the uh, uh, chromosome. We, we have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes. We, we inherit one each from our, uh, one pair from our 
each from our parents. Uh, and then uh, the genes are transcripted uh, uh, from uh, DNA to uh, messenger RNA. And reading uh, genetics for dummies, it was easy. Actually, she used a good term. When you dictate, what's typed is transcripted. So it's not perfect, but it's a good copy. Uh, and then it's translated. Uh, that is, it's a different language. mRNA gets translated. Uh, a messenger RNA gets translated in the ribosome to protein. So it's uh, a different language. And the language goes from DNA to protein. And there's mistake, potential mistakes at every step along the way, uh, inside and outside the nucleus. So this is looking at the ribosome. Uh, the mRNA uh, goes and it attaches to the ribosome. The ribosome reads it, uh, and each little codon, which is three letters, is uh, translated into a specific protein. Um, there are uh, there are a lot more codons than there are protein proteins. So some codons code for similar proteins, and there there are uh, m uh, messages along the mRNA strand to tell what to do to start, to stop, to continue, whatever. And at the end, you can see uh, you end up with a protein. And proteins are very complex structures, and they essentially, they, they tell the body what to do, how to form, and how to interact. So the proteins are the translation of our, of our uh, genome. Uh, this is looking at the uh, hemoglobin genes. You can see uh, the chromosomes are, are 11 and 16, and the hemoglobin uh, genes are, are at different sites on each chromosome, and they code for various types of hemoglobins, uh, epsilon, gamma, delta, beta, uh, zeta, alpha, and, uh, and one, and the, the different, uh, uh, different protein uh, hemoglobin is formed in different uh, formations, and they do different things. The different proteins do different and things as far as the blood. Uh, Simone talked about single nu nucleotide polymorphisms. These are uh, DNA tolerates some kinds of mutation without harming the organism. What's the difference between a mutation and a, polymorphi a polymorphism? Well, there uh, it, it depends on the frequency. Uh, there are many, many different polymorphisms that may result in some change in an amino acid that changes an enzyme that changes drug metabolism. We'll talk about that soon. SNP or single nucle nucleotide polymorphism morphisms occur when one base replaces another, it's a point mutation, such as a T for an A or a G for a C or vice versa, it may change the code for a protein. Uh, and how do we find that? Well, we use gene chips. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. SNPs occur about once every 100 base pairs, making up the bulk of the 3 million variations in the human genome. And what he mentions, there are about 150 million types of SNPs that have actually been identified. But they tend to remain stable. They keep recurring. They tend to remain stable. They may occur in genes and in the surrounding regions that control their expression, may influence activity of the encoded protein in a subtle way or sometimes in a not so subtle way. This is just an example of, of different SNPs. Now, what's PCR? In order to analyze uh, what's going on in somebody's gene, you have to take fragments of DNA. And what scientists have come up with is a way of taking multi of fragments of DNA, purifying it, and subjecting it to polymerase chain reaction so you can make multiple copies of the DNA to use on chips. And the chips, uh, we'll talk about in a minute, they are microarray chips, allow you to mix different types of samples together to get a result, to get an analysis of what's going on in the population or in that individual who in whom you are testing or a disease type of, of individual, which we'll talk about in a minute. So PCR allows mo molecular photocopying in the lab to amplify, to copy small segments of DNA. Uh, it's because you need large amounts of um, molecular, uh, uh, large amounts of DNA for molecular and genetic analysis. And this is a microwave, uh, li little uh, chips that are uh, full of uh, types of DNA that you want. You can take different populations, a normal population or a diseased population, and this is from the Human Genome website. Uh, there are many uh, uh, resources available online because this is all in the public domain. You can just, you can search, you can uh, go to this website, teach you, uh, teaches you all about the human genome. You put uh, them together and you put them through the chips, 
and uh, you um, can uh, mix. The chip contain thousands of gene fragments that make up the gene to be studied and its variant. The DNA from diseased and controls are separated into two single-stranded molecules. Single-stranded fragments, uh, single strands are fragmented into smaller fragments and labeled with a fluorescent dye, red for diseased and green for control. Uh, both are inserted into the chip and are allowed to hybridize, that's to bind, to the synthetic DNA that you can purchase. If there's no mutation for a gene, both red and green will bind to the sequences on the chip, so you know what the outcome is. If a mutation is present, the DNA will bind to the sequence that represents the mutation. So you can analyze your population because of what's prepared, because of all the experience and, and availability uh, of, of these products in order to to study the population that you have. Now, what about genetic polymorphisms and drug response? So we can look at diseases in the population and see if they're SNPs or see what's going on as far as correlating the genome or the genes that code for different responses, and we can test the population. Or we can look at whether certain drugs, depending on this, the uh, genetic polymorphism, will actually be treated uh, appropriately by that individual if that individual has that particular polymorphism. But one of the problems with this is the complexity. I got this uh, uh, from an article in the Journal of uh, uh, Medical Toxicology uh, looking at how drugs are handled. Well, uh, drugs uh, handles, first of all, they're ingested. Then they're absorbed uh, uh, in the GI tract. Uh, then they're translocated through various transporters into the bloodstream. And then they're metabolized in the liver and there are multiple different uh, enzyme systems and transporters that actually uh, have a piece of the action. The cytochrome system is, is a, a case in point. Uh, through the liver or af uh, after it goes to the systemic uh, circulation, the target organ and some of it is cleared in the kidneys. Uh, and then it goes to the target organ, and that depends on the receptors in the target organ. You still are determined, it's still determined by, by transporters and the genes of the receptors and, and other enzyme in the cell in order to determine the response as well as the metabolism of the drug. The clinical response is affected by multiple variations of all of the above. Uh, gene polymorphisms and local DNA and RNA environment affects all of the steps. And you saw the, uh, the scheme that Simon showed as far as how a drug is metabolized in the body and all the influences that, that it that has, have on it. So given that each step is dependent on multiple genes, the range of phenotypes expressed is enormous for complex diseases. Ultimately, and this was his opinion, it's unlikely for identification of single mutations that will determine individual patient phenotypes because of the complexity. I did, uh, thinking back, I was familiar with, because of tolteridine, and this, we know this, that tolteridine metabolism is complex and it wasn't predictable. And because of its uh, uh, effect in, uh, by the CYP2D6 uh, system in the liver, we could only use it at a relatively small dose, which was four milligrams, because after tolteridine is absorbed, uh, some if is converted by uh, in the liver uh, by CYP2D6 to 5-HMT, and some remains as the, the raw drug with extensive metabolizers, and that's determined to some degree by the genetics of the individual patient, uh, whether that patient has CYP2D6, which can metabolize a lot or is uh, deficient in CYP2D6 to some degree will determine the metabolism of tolteridine. It can be uh, uh, extensive metabolizers with a lot of 5-HMT, intermediate me metabolizers with a smaller amount and a more raw drug, and poor metabolizers with uh, a very a low level of HMT and a lot of tolteridine. And that's reflected in the relative levels of the different uh, drug components uh, at four milligrams. And because of its unpredictable predictability of metabolism versus raw drug, we could only go up to a certain dose because it was unpredictable. They've now, we, they, they, they came up with a different drug, which was fesoteridine, which doesn't go through the 2-CYP2D6 in the liver. So that's why 
uh, it can be used at a higher dose because it's metabolized in the serum by esterases, which in, in, in humans, it's, uh, it has nothing at all to do with 2D6. And this shows the uh, 5-HMT uh, as a result of telteridine with the four milligram dose and the eight milligram dose, there's essentially no difference. So we know that drugs, uh, the uh, polymorphisms, uh, SNPs will uh, influence the, the, uh, uh, the, the cytochrome system. It also influences other systems that most likely make uh, play a role. But what about the genetics of of, of uh, overactive bladder and uh, the conditions that we deal with. Well, it is interesting uh, that uh, polymorphisms uh, or single uh, nucleotide polymorphism has been identified in uh, patients uh, with overactive bladder. And a number of studies uh, have looked at that. And this is a study uh, from Japan, uh, 100 uh, OAB women versus 101 controls. They used hair root samples for DNA analysis with PCR, and you know what PCR is now. Uh, there is a SNP of tryptophan for arginine in posi position 64 on the beta adrenal receptor gene. That's been identified before. And what they did is they looked looked at the, to see the presence of this SNP in patients with overactive bladder, and they found that 47% uh, of them versus 22% of the non-OAB patients had the SNP, uh, that is the single nucleotide polymorphism. So it may tell us that it's more likely that these patients will have that polymorphism. However, OAB symptoms were uh, just as uh, no difference whether they had the uh, 64R genine carrier uh, from the normal gene carrier. So it, was, it didn't go the opposite way. That is, if they had the, the uh, polymorphism, uh, some patients with the polymorphism uh, had overactive bladder symptoms and some patients had normal symptoms. And, the pa and some of the patients in the, uh, the non-OAB group also had the polymorphism. So we know that OAB is multifactorial, and just knowing a SNP doesn't tell you that that patient will have the disease. Uh, similarly, with uh, anticholinergic treatment in children, this is a study from uh, from uh, from Turkey: uh, children with LUTs versus children with no LUTs. They looked at genomic DNA from all children. They're known polymorphisms of cholinergic pathways, but it didn't. So uh, their postulation was that if these patients uh, with uh, OAB had the SNPs, uh, it may have affected the treatment, but the SNPs had no impact on treatment, again, because of the multifactorial nature of the condition and the multifactorial nature of drug metabolism. So drug effects uh, are determined, and thank you, Tara, uh, Cara, for, for helping me with this, uh, determined by pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic factors, determined by absorption, metabolism, distribution, target effects, and elimination, their drug gene, uh, and drug-drug interactions. So we can't uh, ignore not only the drug gene interactions, but there are also drug-drug interactions in patients with polypharmacy, and who knows whether genes are turned on on and off as a result of the combinations of the drugs, which may or may not have been studied. So what about genetic determinants of disease as far as lower urinary tract uh, is concerned? Well, we now know that there, there's more and more studies coming out. This is a systematic review looking at candidate gene associations with lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, the topic of personalized medicine uh, in patients with BPH looking at genetic determinants. Uh, and this is a recent uh, publication on looking at genetic contribution to urgent, uh, urgency urinary incontinence. It's beginning. So in conclusion, LUTs is common. The impact is significant. The Human Genome Project has given rise to revolutionary innovation and access to uh, information. Genetic determinants of LUTs and therapy are only beginning. And the complexity, unfortunately, the complexity increases with our increasing knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Santa, for uh, a great introduction to most of, to me particularly, and I'm sure to many people in this new subject. 
and to Cara again for promoting this uh, this area. Does anybody have any questions to uh, put out the sender? Yes, that's one over here. Rose Kavari, Rose Kavari from Houston, uh, Texas. I have a quick question. Where do you think this plays, um, this genetic determinants, would play a role in the more um, local delivery of the drugs that we do, such as Botox? Like, would there would there be a role of looking into it and see some people are responders, they last longer in them, or they, you know, they it works better more better for them? Well, I. I I, I agree. I think I think you can look at the different components of where you postulate the drug is going to work, and look at whether there's some genetic determinant of either um, contraction, relaxation, sensation, or whatever. I think even though you may say it's simple, it's still complex in it uh, in, in when when you actually analyze it. But I think you know everything is worth looking at, and it's amazing. Uh, one of the other things that struck me. Um, because of the Human Genome Project, and, and it was founded on the basis of sharing knowledge. If you look at uh, genetic articles in, on PubMed, they're open access, most of them, which is also very encouraging. Kara is coming up for questions. Thank you much, very much, Sandra. You did an excellent job reviewing that. Um, you and I have had talks a few years ago probably about drug-drug interactions and if a patient's taking two drugs that are metabolized by the 2D6 system, does it really make a difference? Do you need to alter the dose? So based on your review, do you think it's likely that any of these genetic polymorphisms or interactions accounts for the variability in response that we see in our patients with OAB when we give them anticholinergic or, or beta adrenergic drugs. Does, after your reading, does it seem like that might be possible? Oh, definitely. Oh I, oh, I agree, of course. I mean, knowing the CYP2D6, just looking at a drug like Talteridine, you, probably, you can imagine that there are different responders in the population, and th this is something we know about aren't screening for it in clinic yet. No, we, we can't. Again, uh, the knowledge is out there, how to incorporate that knowledge in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. That's another challenge. Another question on the back. Lawrence Stewart from, U, from UK. Um, I think this is all fascinating stuff. Um, it takes me back to high school. But do you think we can practically use this because Genes ultimately are the library to produce proteins for us, but on top of this, we've got epigenetics, which is something I've come to relatively recently. And so genes can be switched on and switched off. So just because the, we've found the gene doesn't mean to say it's active, and that's a whole new level of complexity. Oh yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's um, it's very complex, and uh, I don't think we have any any tools that we use today in our practices uh, where we can put it to use. And yeah, but epigenetics is just another piece of the puzzle. It's very complex. And uh, my, my, last, my last point, but the complexity increases as our knowledge increases. But that shouldn't be a barrier. <laughs> okay, thank you, Santa. This